So now we will start module 4 and uh, in this module we will complete the discussion on matrices. We will talk about uh, matrix rank, inverse of matrix, eigenvalues, eigenvectors and then we will talk about special mat matrices and normal modes. So today I will be talking about the rank of a matrix and the inverse of a matrix. Okay. So, so let us get to the rank of a matrix. Now in order to define the rank of a matrix. Uh, it helps to treat the matrix as a collection of vectors. So your matrix is treated as a collection of vectors. Okay. So how do you think about this? And you can treat it either row wise or column wise. So suppose you have a matrix, okay, a typical matrix. So so I'll just take a typical our typical matrix A11, A12, etc., up to A1n, A21, A22 all the way up to A to N and then similarly all the way let us me take A M 1, A M 2 all the way up to A M N. So this is an M by N matrix. So this is an M by N matrix. Now I said that you can treat this as a collection of vectors. So you can think of each row as a vector, I will just use a different color. So you can treat each column as a vector in this way. So you can think of this as a collection of vectors either as uh, column wise column wise or row wise. So how do you think of it? So suppose I want to think of this as a collection of column wise vectors. So column wise I would just say A11, A21, I would treat this as one vector. Then I would think of another vector A12 up to AM2. So you can say, you can see all the way. So what I am doing is I am treating this column as a vector, this column as a vector, each of these columns as a vector. Okay. So all the way up to A1n, A2n, all the way up to Amn. So, so if I treat it column wise, I have n vectors, n column vectors. Now alternatively and you can see this I do not uh, I do not really need to emphasize this this is row wise. So if you think of it row wise you can think of it as m row vectors okay. and these row vectors will look like a11, a12, a1n then you will have similarly you can have a21, a22 all the way up to a 2 n and then all and then and then you can have various vectors all the way up to a m 1, a m 2 all the way up to a m n. So, so sometimes it is very useful to think of this matrix as a collection of vectors and you can think of it either as a collection of, of uh, m row vectors or you can think of it as a collection of n column vectors. Okay. So, this this basic idea of thinking about matrices as collection of vectors is what you need in order to define a rank. Okay. Once you think about this matrix as a collection of vectors then the question you ask you can ask is are they linearly are these vectors linearly independent or dependent. Okay. So, so now the rank, rank is nothing but, is nothing but uh, number of linearly independent rows or column vectors. 
So, so if you want to find the rank of a matrix, you what you do is you think of these you think of this matrix either as a collection of n column vectors or you can think of it as a collection of m row vectors. Okay. Then of these, so, so suppose you are thinking about it as n column vectors, then you can ask the question uh, how many of these column vectors are linearly independent. Okay. So, so you will have some number which is less than n okay, as a rank of a matrix. Alternatively, you could think of row vectors okay, and uh, you will get a number, now you ask how many of these row vectors are linearly independent, you will get a number that is less than m okay, and that is the rank of the matrix. Now what is important is that it does not matter whether you take row or column vectors, you will get the same rank and this is fairly easy to show. So it is, uh, I will just underline this in a different color. So does not matter if rows or columns are used. Okay. So the idea is that uh, you can use either row or column and and you are fine to calculate the rank. Okay. So, so what this implies is that uh, this implies that your rank must be strictly less than or equal to the minimum of m and n. Okay. So, what that means is uh, if you have fewer rows than columns, then the rank must be either equal to or smaller than that number of rows. Similarly, if you have fewer columns and rows, then the rank must be uh, lower than the number of columns. Okay. So, rank has to be less than number of rows and it has to be uh, less than or equal to number of rows and less than or equal to number of columns. Okay. And so, we can write this as saying that the rank is less than the minimum of, of the uh, number of rows and the number of columns. Okay. And uh, remember, uh, you have an m by n matrix. This is for an n by m matrix. Okay, so so now uh, this is what uh, it helps you the rank, and uh, you can immediately see that uh, since we already said that the maximum number of linearly independent vectors is equal to the basis. Okay, uh, so maximum number of linearly independent vectors in any space is the is basically the number of vectors in the basis. Your rank will give you some if you look at a vector space and you consider various vectors in that space, okay, then the maximum number of linearly independent vectors is related to the basis. So, in that way you can also, you can also relate rank of matrix, rank of matrix has to be less than or equal to basis. So, it is less than or equal to uh, number of basis vectors, vectors. So, it is less than or equal to number of basis vectors in that in, in the appropriate space that you are considering. Okay. Now, let us uh, let us uh, go and see, see uh, some examples okay, where you can determine the rank of a matrix. So, so suppose I take uh, suppose I take a matrix that looks like that looks I will just take some examples. So, 0, 1, 2, 2, 1, 3 okay. and I take and I take the, I take this as 2, 2, 5. Okay. Now, now uh, if you want to determine the rank of a matrix, you can use either the rows or the columns. So, rank using rows. So, if you use rows, okay, then you have three vectors. So, you have this vector 0, 1, 2, you have another vector 2, 1, 3 and you have vector 2, 2, 5. Okay. And uh, if you want to ask how many of these vectors are linearly independent, okay, uh, you can immediately just by inspection you can see that uh, you can see that uh, rank equal to 2 because 2, 2, 5 is equal to 2, 1, 3 plus 0, 1, 2. So, in this case you can immediately see the rank, you can see that the rank should be equal to 2 because, uh, because I can write this third vector as a linear combination of first two vectors. Okay. And uh, not only can I do that, okay, but uh, 
addition to that you can see that uh, that uh, if you take if you take the first and second vectors they are clearly linearly independent so the rank is not 1 rank is equal to 2 so in general you can take any matrix you can you, you can do the same using columns and you will get the same answer okay and uh, basically the rank is independent whether you take rows or columns all right now uh, now we can ask uh, the next uh, next question as to where do you use the rank okay so now rank of a matrix is actually extremely useful in solving linear equations now now you remember that we wrote wrote your system of linear equations okay so your system of linear equations we can write it in matrix form so, so if you remember we had it a11 x 1 plus a12 x2 plus all the way up to let us say a1n xn is equal to b1 and you had the system of equations so you had a21 x1 plus a22 x2 and all the way up to a2n xn equal to b2 and we had had the same thing all the way up to am1 x1 plus am2 x2 plus all the way up to amn xn this was equal to bm okay and we wrote this whole system in the compact matrix one form a which a is a matrix x x is a vector and this is equal to b so we had this simple notation where a was basically this matrix that we had before uh, with with coefficients a11 a12 and so on so now if you remember we had uh, we when we were solving linear equations uh, we said that uh, in order to be able to solve okay in order to be able to solve these equations okay the equations should be should be should be both uh, sufficient and consistent so should be sufficient and consistent okay so in general we said that the number of uh, number of unknowns should be equal to the number of equations okay so in general we said that not only the number of unknowns should be equal to number of equations but also that the equations should be internally consistent with each other okay you cannot have equations that are inconsistent okay so uh, so now we can express this in a in a very nice form using the rank of a matrix okay so so this condition can be expressed in a compact way using rank of a matrix so so we'll define define augmented matrix a tilde okay so we define an augmented matrix a tilde okay which uh, what does it look like it basically looks like uh, it looks like a matrix that is formed all, all these are just a a is here and then and then you you put the column of b uh, right on the right side so you have all the all the elements of a okay and then you have one one extra column containing elements of b so this is a m cross n plus 1 matrix Okay. So, now if you define this uh, m cross n by 1 matrix A tilde okay, which is called the augmented matrix. Okay. Now, uh, what is the condition for uh, the system of equations to be both sufficient and consistent is that uh, rank of A, of A should be equal to rank of A tilde. So, the rank of A should be equal to the rank of A tilde and this should be equal to number of unknowns. Okay. So, if this if this condition is satisfied okay, then then you know that the equations have a unique solutions. So, so then equations have unique solution.
unique solution. Okay. So, if the rank of A equal to rank of A tilde, okay, then you are guaranteed that the equations are consistent. Now, further if the rank is equal to the number of unknowns, then you know that the uh, equations have a unique solution. Okay, number of unknowns. So, so in other words, you can say uh, rank is equal to uh, minimum of m by n. So, it is whichever is less between m and n. So, it should be equal to that. Okay. So, so then you can be sure that the equations have a unique solution. Okay. Now, uh, this is a very powerful result because you can determine the rank of A and rank of A tilde fairly easily just by checking for linearly linear independence and you can use this to actually say whether your equations are consistent or not, whether they have one solution. You can also extend it to other cases. You can ask questions like uh, what happens if rank of A is uh, let us say less than or equal to minimum of m cross n, okay, but rank of A equal to rank of A tilde. Okay, so, so, suppose you had a case where the rank of A is equal to the rank of A tilde. Okay, so, this guarantees consistency, ensures consistency. That means the equations will not be inconsistent. Okay. And uh, when rank is less than or equal to the minimum of uh, m and n, okay, you can have more than one solution. Okay. So, that means you have some equations that are actually dependent on the others. And uh, what that means is that you can have, uh, have multiple solutions. Uh, so, rank of A less than number of unknowns. So, what I meant to say here is that it should be strictly. So, if it is less than the number of unknowns, okay. So, if they if your rank is less than the number of unknowns, okay, then uh, then uh, you have multiple solutions possible, okay. And uh, we'll see we'll see examples of this. Uh, over the over the course uh, over over the next few lectures okay but uh, basically this way of using ranks okay you don't need to actually check e each of the equations to see whether they are consistent or not you can directly use the idea of ranks to to check for consistency okay so now uh, what happens if uh, if if uh, if if we have too many equations any equations and uh, too few unknowns okay we have too many equations and too few unknowns okay then you would say that some of the equations are redundant if they are consistent okay then uh, they have to be redundant so if rank of a equal to rank of a tilde okay then uh, equations are consistent consistent and solution exists. Okay. So, if you have too many equations and too few unknowns, okay, you can, uh, uh, but if the equations are consistent, then the solution will exist. Okay. So, even if you have too many equations, okay, so long as you have rank of A equal to rank of A tilde, you are guaranteed a solution. Okay. Now, if you want a unique solution, Okay, then uh, the number of unknowns should not be less than the number of equations. Okay, so then you can ensure that the solutions are consistent. Okay, so 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 if you have too many unknowns and too few equations, okay, then uh, multiple solutions. So so I'll just I'll just write this explicitly. So if rank A equal to rank A tilde, then uh, the consistent, the equations are consistent and solution exists. Okay. Now, uh, if we have 
if m is less than n, so if m less than n, okay, then multiple solutions or uh, you know more than one solution. Okay, then more than one solution exists. Okay, so so if m is greater than equal to n, okay, then unique solutions. Unique solution. Okay, so so this is the basic uh, use of rank in solving linear equations. Okay, now next. Uh, Next thing I want to talk about is uh, the inverse of a matrix and how we use the inverse of a matrix in solving linear equations. So, so we had already seen earlier that, uh, that uh, if you have a matrix A, then uh, A, A inverse, so this is called the inverse of A, okay. this is called the inverse of A, okay. this is equal to A inverse A equal to I. So, so again, again we'll restrict to square matrices. Okay. So now the when you have a square matrix, you know that uh, the matrix can have an inverse, and if the inverse exists, it is unique. Okay, and uh, the inverse satisfies this equation. So now suppose I had suppose I had an equation a x equal to b. So, suppose I had my matrix, my system of linear equations that we had earlier, okay. then you can immediately see that this implies x is equal to a inverse b. a inverse is a matrix. So, suppose I multiply both sides by a inverse, okay. then you can clearly see that a inverse a is, is nothing but the identity matrix. Okay. So, this is what we call the identity matrix. And what you have is that I can write x as a inverse b. Okay. So, so basically if I know the inverse of this matrix A, then I know the solution. Then I can immediately solve for b. So, suppose I have a set of equations and uh, I write it in matrix form and I calculate the inverse of that matrix, I immediately know the solutions of those set of equations. Okay. Now, uh, the, I mean you have, you, you have already seen solving a system of equations using Kramer's rule. Okay. So, now we can see what is the connection. So, when you solve the equations using Kramer's rule, then you we saw determinants coming in. Okay. So, now uh, here this gives another solution using inverses. Okay. So, um, so, so, compare solutions using determinants. that is what we call as Kramer's rule and using inverse. Okay. So, what I mean is that what I mean is that you have the same vector that can be expressed as two different ways. One is using this inverse of a matrix and the other is using determinants. So, what that implies is that uh, there should be a relation be a relation between inverse and determinant. Okay. So, so just based on this you would conclude that there should be a relation between the inverse of a matrix and the determinant of a matrix and uh, you know various determinants uh, involving matrices. Okay, so uh, so let's write an expression for inverse using determinants. I'll just write the expression. It is fairly easy to verify. Okay, so so suppose I have a matrix A. Okay, I can write A inverse in the following form. I can write it as one divided by determinant of A, and uh, I'll just I'll just say determinant of A. This is the determinant of the matrix. Okay, and uh, I'll just and uh, A inverse is a matrix, okay. so it should have various 
terms here. What are the various elements of this matrix? So, the first element I will call it as uh, A11, uh, I am using the notation of capital A11. This is A not instead of 1, 2, I will write A21 here and I will write A12 here all the way up to A. 1 n and here I go all the way up to a n 1 a 2 2 and all the way up to a n n. Okay, so, so, so what is a a 1 1 is called the cofactor of a 1 1. So, we saw earlier that the cofactor of any any element okay, is the is the value of the determinant you get when you uh, remove that row and that column okay is the value of the determinant of the matrix obtained by removing that row and that column okay so each of these each of these is a determinant so a11 is a is an n minus 1 cross n minus 1 determinant so this is a n minus 1 uh, it's the it's the determinant what I mean is it is a determinant of a matrix of size n minus 1 times n minus 1 okay. and uh, once again let me remind you what the cofactor is. Okay. So, the cofactor if you if you if you had a matrix a 1 1 a 1 2 a 1 n a 2 1 a 2 2 a 2 n a n 1 a n 2 up to a n n. Okay, so, if you had a matrix like this, let us say if I want to calculate uh, cofactor of uh, I will just take some element, okay. let me take uh, a 1 3 or, or, or let me take a 2 3, a 2 3 that will make it that will make it more interesting. So, suppose I have a 2 3 here. Now, if I want to calculate the cofactor of a 2 3, okay, then this is the second row and the third column. So, what I do is I want to calculate the cofactor of this this element okay. and what, what I should do is I imagine that I, I imagine that I consider a matrix where this row and this column are removed. Okay. So, if I remove this row and this column and then and then I and then what does my matrix looks like now now I have to start from the a 2 3. Okay. So, the so the so the matrix now will look the following way. So, so my cofactor is the is the determinant of this matrix and that matrix is given by the following way. So, so, so if I remove this row and this column okay, then what I have is a matrix that is starting with uh, this will be a 3 4. Okay, so, this uh, this matrix starts with a 3 4, a 3 5 all the way up to a 3 n. Okay, so, then you go all the way up to a 3 n, okay, then you are still left with uh, a 3 1 and a 3 2. So, it comes all the way up to a 3 1 a 3 2. So, that is how you write the cofactor. Then in the next row you will have next row will start with uh, a 4 4, a 4 5 and you go all the way up to a 4 n, a 4 1, a 4 2. So, you go all the way up to a n 4, a n 5, a n n, a n 1, a and 2 ok. So, that is that is what you will end up here with this last with this last row ok. Then you have to come back to the first row. So, then you will still have one more uh, row which is a 1 4, a 1 5 all the way up to a 1 n and then a 1 1, a 1 2 ok. So, so this is an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix where you have removed the second row and the third column ok and you take the determinant of this this is what is the cofactor ok. So, so the cofactor of cofactor of any element of a matrix ok is obtained in this way and uh, the inverse of the matrix can be expressed in terms of cofactors. Now, notice that there is a determinant that appears in the expression of the inverse. 
okay now uh, and it is a 1 over the determinant okay so what this implies is that uh, if of a equal to 0 then that implies matrix inverse does not exist a inverse does not exist again a very very powerful result okay if the determinant is 0 okay then the inverse does not exist okay and uh, this is actually a very useful property of uh, of matrices that you can immediately tell whether you can invert a matrix or not by looking at the determinants 